Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman. And everyone out there, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, hey, you know, ha happy April 1st, April Fool's Day. And of course, uh, also known as the day that the internet becomes practically useless. Uh, hopefully you are not uh, succumbing to any kind of tricks or anything like that. But uh, hey, you know, hopefully everyone want to understand it's all in good fun so uh yeah everyone hey welcome into the program so uh today on the show in the second part of the uh of the hour we will be doing computer and technology news that's where we try to our that's where we're gonna try our best to weed through all the fake stuff and try to find some good real honest uh reporting news uh, any product updates things like that and you can of course definitely check that out uh in the first part of the show we are very excited to talk with our guest today and that is none other than loom Cube. You may have heard that before because up on our website right now, you can go find it at computeramerica.com. You can find a review for the Loom Cube. Uh, we actually just reviewed it last week and uh, it was a real pleasure to do so. And of course, happy to have them on to, uh, you know, just to talk about it. So everyone, before we get started, first things first, computeramerica.com. That's where you'll find the article. That's where you'll find the show notes. That's where you will find a link to our guest website and so much more. Also, be sure to check out the live video portion as well as the chat room. And uh, yeah, hey, I think that's, uh, that's pretty good for the morning announcements. So let's go ahead and get things started. Uh, joining us today, as I said before, is a company called LoomCube. And if you haven't heard of them, then hey, this is going to be the perfect show for you. Uh, joining us today is none other than Mr. Riley Strickland. He is the co-founder and VP of sales and marketing for the company. And uh, Riley, welcome on to Computer America. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Perfect, perfect. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. So obviously, uh, this is going to be a segment about lighting and the importance of good lighting. But before we get into the product and what it is you have to offer, give us some background. Uh, give us some background on LoomCube. When was it started? And a bit of yourself. Uh, did, you, did you always work in tech? Or is this kind of new for you? Uh, no, been uh, LoomCube actually was started in 2014. So uh, the the founder of the company, Mornay Sherry, and co-founders Matt Cummins and myself, uh, we were all working in the software space prior to starting LoomCube, uh, mainly in the imaging software space. And they had extensive experience, uh, Mornay and Matt, in Nick software and some professional software in the past. And so really identifying lighting as kind of the true key to creating either a good image or good video quality. Um, you know, without good light, no matter what camera you're using, it's going to be kind of a, a, a poor quality image. So even if you're using a $50,000 camera with beautiful lenses, if it's poorly lit, it's not going to be good quality. And so really kind of drumming down on the importance of light in 2014, we branched off to start a Kickstarter campaign. So that's actually crowdfunding is the origin of, uh, of LoomCube's story. Back in 2014, we did a Kickstarter and raised about $230,000 on the idea for a small, portable, waterproof lighting device. And uh, yeah, we're, we're coming up now. I think actually 
April 1st is is about our five-year mark as a company. So still fairly young, and we're operating here out of San Diego, California. Very, very cool. Congratulations. And, and obviously, uh, you're putting out all, you know, uh, a few different products and all of them revolve around lighting. We're going to talk about, uh, let's see, we just uh, you know reviewed the Loom Cube Air, I believe is the one that we have up on our website now, so we're gonna get into that. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start with the basics and uh, let's talk about the Loom Cube itself because there's this one and then the Air. Let's talk about the original, uh, the one that you started the Kickstarter for, everyone seemed to really be behind the idea. Uh, talk about where, I guess, in the market, you kind of saw yourself coming in because I'm sure lighting that's uh, that's been around since the early 1900s and of course you know fire before that but I, I mean lighting has been in the market before what was the need that you were really seeing was it uh, you know we've seen some product images on your website of drones we've seen people hiking and camping and going biking and things like that uh, where was the need before loom cube Absolutely, yeah. It's, uh, the business has changed a bit over time, uh, as as businesses do, and, and markets shift and change. But really, the or- origin of the company and where the the first product kind of met a need was this was in 2013, 2014. So a big shift coming. Uh, our team had the the history in the pro photography market, and that's where our history was. But obviously, in the last decade, we've seen this massive transition to people taking more images on their mobile devices than they are with digital cameras. And, you know, you always have it with you. It's got a pretty good camera on it. But, of course, from a small cell phone type perspective, your sensor in that camera is quite small. And so, as we've all probably had the experience, you might be at a bar trying to take a photo with friends or in a a dark, poorly lit place after dark in low light your iPhone or your Android does not take a good quality photo or video. It ends up being all grainy and noisy. And so software can only kind of fix this to a degree. So that was a portion of the idea was uh, it was essentially two part to create a small lighting device to be the video light to the iPhone as which larger LED and video lights were to professional videographers. And then on the flip side, us being in San Diego, very outdoor action lifestyle uh, location, this was at the height and kind of just after the IPO of GoPro. So us coming from the imaging category, we knew that lighting was the core to getting good quality imagery or good quality video. And here was GoPro, this small camera, millions and millions of units being sold every year, Mm -hmm. yet there was no light designed to support that camera. And so GoPro lighting was kind of a big early part of our business. Uh, You you know, you've got 20 million cameras out there. There's no light designed for it. So essentially the early stage in the original Loom Cube, kind of the idea was to be uh, the GoPro of light, if you will. Waterproof 200 feet, super durable, could go anywhere your GoPro could go. You could scuba dive underwater and get great footage. You could mountain bike at night and get great footage. So the light that paired with your GoPro. Um, and what was that was kind of the original intention, and you see that based on the original Kickstarter campaign. But what was really unique is once we came to market, we actually were really embraced positively by the professional photo and video community. So the history of their lighting options as a pro photographer, pro videographer, really was big, bulky lights with cables and batteries and light stands. And here comes a high quality, professional quality light that can pretty much fit in your pocket that puts out a pro quality light source at a price point of only 79 bucks. That's where the business really kind of exploded. And as you mentioned, you see a lot of the high quality photo and video on our, our social channels. Um, so that's, that's been a big market for us. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, you know, uh, it's one thing I, I really enjoyed about the, you know, the product that I, that we reviewed, and I'm sure this has been a functionality of LoomCube for a while, was that it's not just a source of light, but you mentioned it pairing with the GoPro. Uh, GoPro is still front and center in the mobile app that you have with it, but um, it's very much like an extension of whatever device you use it for. And at least with Bluetooth and, you know, if it can pair with it and smartphones, uh, you know, it can, like, like, let's say you take a photo, the Loom Cube will actually act as a different flash or it will be a continuous source of light. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's more intelligent than just a really good flashlight, I, I guess. Correct. 
Correct. Yeah, we've built in, we've got the Bluetooth app capability, which really allows you to control it from, you know, 0% to 100%. You can control flash durations, you can use a, a varying strobe mode. Um, and then what we've done as a result of that and kind of understanding how our customers are using it, uh, what the needs are of that, that final end consumer, is we've created an absolute, you know, plethora of accessories from color gels and diffusers and, and mounting capabilities for mounting on, on bikes, on bars, on cameras, on GoPros, um, on drones, as you mentioned. And so realistically, uh, our kind of early trademark was the world's most versatile light. And it was this one light source that had a professional quality, professional quality light output. Uh, you could pair it with your phone, you could control it via Bluetooth, but at the same time, you weren't limited to what you wanted to do. If you wanted to take that 40 feet underwater and go scuba dive in Hawaii with the manta rays and get great footage of your of your trip, you can bring your Loom Cube with you. You can use it for that light source. Then you can pop up and you can mount it on your DJI Mavic drone and you can fly it 400 feet in the sky and get some overhead lighting and do some cool light painting with long exposure photography and, and, and everything in between. Um, so that's what's really cool about just the need for a small portable light is that it isn't kind of a singular focus or designed for just one thing. At the end of the day, we kind of joke, you know, one of the things that keeps us in business is the sun goes down every day. So we know that there's going to be those dark hours. And not only should the fun not stop when it goes down, but the creativity shouldn't stop either. If you want to get out there and and fly your drone and take, you know, astrological photos or, or go scuba dive or do whatever you want to do, we want to be there to help allow you to do that and give you a proper quality light to do so. Hello. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Check. Just, uh, there we go. Uh, sorry about that. So everyone out there, uh, hopefully you can hear me. Riley, we're good now. Uh, yep. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, you know, right there, front and center on your website, we we were checking out you know some of the different uses, and we're going over the uses of the Loom Cube. And trust me, on the show here, we invite people on all the time. We have a video portion, so we get to see a lot of people's uh, offices and you know in their workspaces. And I'll be honest, you know, something that doesn't really come into uh, consideration when you design an office is lighting. You know, uh, it's just whatever you have over your head or if it's at home, it's just general lighting. Uh, Right here on your website, you mentioned video conferencing. Are you seeing any kind of, uh, you know, kind of increase demand or, you know, people saying, you know, I was looking for something to help, you know, when I do video conferencing or when I, uh, you know, talk with other people because something as simple as just a singular light kind of head on to illuminate you instead of the background, uh, it helps immensely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been an, an interesting one. And that was the one that we launched at CES earlier this year. And it's gotten a great response. And I think it's a it addresses a pain point that probably most of us have experienced one time or another, you know, whether you're on FaceTime on your phone, uh, chatting with family, or you're hopping on a business call and you go down to your conference room and you realize, you know, you can see the wall behind you or there's a window and you are just a black silhouette Mm -hmm. and, uh, or just, you know, you have the overhead lighting. Most offices around will have that overhead fluorescent lighting. And so when lighting comes from above you, you get these kind of shadows under your eyes, you get the shadows under your chin, and it ends up, you know, you just don't look proper. And uh, and so not only do we see, I mean, we, we have product in every Apple store in the world. And so we work closely with Apple and kind of when addressing uh, some of their needs and and just the focus is we realized we saw this opportunity that we provide lighting for cameras, and that was kind of the history of the, the company. So whether it be GoPros, uh, filmmaking on your iPhone, DSLR cameras for photo and video, and then we took a step back and realized, you know, if our, if our business is illuminating cameras, one of the most common cameras being used on the day-to-day environment is the camera within your laptop uh, or your webcam, and it's just filming you. It's a much closer, more intimate experience. And so just the simple addition of a little bit of light has has given people a huge increase in terms of just the output of putting your best foot forward and whether it's being properly lit on on a Skype interview that you might be have on business calls with colleagues or even just calling home on that FaceTime call to uh, to visually communicate with your family who might be on the other coast. 
at the end of the day, we all want to put our best foot forward. We want to look our best and, of course, be visible and, and quality to the, the other party. And so it's been a really great addition, and it's been something that there really hasn't been any specific solutions out there designed right. for, uh, particularly addressing that image. Yet it is an issue, kind of looking poor and the poor quality output of, of webcams that tens of millions of people are, are experiencing on the daily. So and it's been really cool to uh, to see that happen. It, 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 this is just kind of a, a personal experience, but uh, obviously here in the studio we use a green screen, and when you go looking for uh, solutions for illuminating a green screen or yourself, and you know making sure you get a good proper image, uh, the the lighting solutions for that, uh, you can get giant rigs that are going to take up a lot of floor space, and you know that's going to be good, or you can get you know some kind of slap together kind of stuff, but overall. It, the best solutions really are either really expensive or really inconvenient. And I got to say just something that we found, you know, uh, when we were using it was that we actually enjoyed, uh, you know, getting two of them and actually using it to, you know, highlight our, our green screen. Like I, I'm, I'm, I know that webcam and, uh, you know, live content, things like that probably tie in hand to hand. But if anyone out there ever has aspirations to stream, which is really, you know, getting very popular or making YouTube videos with a green screen, uh, I found this to be actually really, really helpful because it's a really bright light. I, that is one thing I really want to emphasize. This thing is like at, at, at max settings without a filter or any kind of diffuser, uh, this thing hurts your eyes, and that's a good thing. <laughs> It, it is the truth. Yeah, a lot of we've got some patented technology that uh, is really around putting uh, a high, high powered light in such a small casing. And so that's really what we wanted to do is most of the lights on the market that you might find on Amazon or uh, either the ones that put out this quality light are usually much larger and, and much more expensive. And the alternative, if you're just looking for kind of a low cost lighting solution and you go on Amazon, usually it's a much, much lower power, lower quality light. Um, and, and really an imagery, what's unique, particularly on the streaming side, as I'm sure you know, is uh, everybody is, is different in terms of skin tones. So the actual light that you're going to put on yourself if you're going to do a self-broadcast or a streaming, uh, you want to make sure that the, your skin tones are going to be accurately reflected. And there's a few kind of scientific terms in the, in the lighting world that are really important when choosing that light. And so for us, we've designed what this Loom Cube Air and the Loom Cube Air VC to be a really, really accurately balanced light to portray skin tones. And then inside of the kit, you're, you're actually given a, a white diffuser and an orange kind of, we call it like a bronzing diffuser to right. fit some more of those warmer color temperatures. Uh, it almost makes you look like you just got back from Hawaii, but really warms up the skin tone and, and helps you accurately portray exactly the, uh, the skin tone that you want to represent. So it gives you a lot of that quality and, and that option in terms of when you are going to go live or set that... Uh, that live stream up to be properly lit and look your absolute best. Exactly. You don't want to be washed out and just, you know, looking really, really poorly. But um, if you want to actually, if we take just a small step back, could you describe the differences? Because I, I think you mentioned that Loom, Loom Cube Air was debuted at CES this year. Uh, what were some of the key differences between uh, the Loom Cube, which is just, you know, kind of the base model, which you still sell, and the Loom Cube Air, which you just released? Uh, what were the differences? Sure. So, so we created the Loom Cube Air is essentially, you know, as you would think with the the DJI Mavic versus Mavic Air or the MacBook versus MacBook Air, it's the slimmed down version of the Loom Cube. So that's probably the biggest difference right out of the gate is it is smaller, a little bit more pocket friendly, uh, slimmer in size. And really what we did was design that for more of the mobile on the go user who was out less outside of the pho uh, photographic realm and more on kind of the everyday. So uh, kind of a little nutshell recap is the Loom Cube being used on GoPros and cameras and, and videographers. You know, those type of customers, they have a camera bag. So they'll put all of their Loom Cubes inside of their camera bag. Um, but the customer for the, the Loom Cube Air, which is more of the your Apple customer uh, for desktops and laptops and for iPhones and, and mobile phones, smartphone filmmaking, uh, that person doesn't necessarily carry a camera bag with you. So your pocket might be acting as your camera bag where your accessories fit. So slimmed down version, which is a little bit more pocket friendly, it, it, we've 
to do that, we've pulled back the brightness from the Loom Cube about uh, 30%. So the Loom Cube has a 1500 lumen LED. The Loom Cube Air is a 1000 lumen LED. Um, very, very bright, as you mentioned. And we added a few cool features as well, kind of the Loom Cube came out in about 2016. So over those last two to three years, we got a bunch of great feedback from our market in terms of ways that we could improve the light. Uh, we brought down the size, which allows it to be more convenient, but we've actually improved the light output. And as we mentioned, with this light being a little bit more focused on your self-broadcasting, live broadcasting, uh, close-to-close environment, uh, we improved the the CRI output and the color temperature of the light to more accurately represent skin tones. And then just from an everyday perspective, we actually added in a magnet. So the the unit is 100% magnetic. You can throw it up on any metal surface, kind of build a little studio on the go. And uh, and then, as I mentioned, the, the unique difference between the two is that because the Loom Cube Air is going to be more focused on your self-broadcasting and filming uh, people and interviews, if you will, uh, we've included those two gels and diffusers inside of the box. So the price point for the Loom Cube is a, an $80 product. The Loom Cube Air is $69.95, and that one comes with the white and the orange diffusers, as well as the upgraded LED. So we brought the price down by $10 mm-hmm. and improved the output and even added in some accessories. So really just trying to keep the barrier as low to entry as possible for people to get a high quality lighting solution, something that can be used in their everyday life for all of their photo, video, and live streaming and, uh, and not have them go out and have to spend three, $400. Right. And yeah. And, and really overall, we definitely enjoyed the, you know, kind of using it with the companion app, the app, uh, super easy to get and super easy to pair Bluetooth. So, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it's going to, uh, connect with a lot of different things, and so and and just real quick, I mean, you mentioned that you can hook up multiple uh, lights for one unit, you know, so like for a phone or a drone or something like that. Uh, is four the maximum or two? No, you actually um, really we have a pretty high maximum. Um, really, five to ten is our recommended maximum. Mm-hmm. So there really is unlimited. I mean, if I were speaking technically, the limit from a technical perspective is 99. Mm. You could connect 99 lights to your iPhone, but because (laughs) it is via Bluetooth, when you kind of get above the the 10 unit radius, uh, you start experiencing some latency. So really what we market is about up to 10 units you can connect to your single device, which is really cool because you could place them all around your room and just while you're in a single studio, you could sit there with your smartphone and have four or five, six Loom Cubes around your set as your studio lighting and control each one independently from the palm of your hand uh, to really get that perfect lighting. So that's kind of one of those features that's built in that allows you a little bit more of that kind of smart technology so you don't have to run around the room adjusting light. You can just do it from the palm of your hand and have a really quick and efficient way to, to balance your lighting. I gotcha, I gotcha. And so the the one thing that we kind of had a question about in our review, and I'd love to be able to update this, you know, after this conversation, but uh, when we were going through and it was asking for permissions, and it's not uncommon for, you know, devices to ask for different permissions, the one that, you know, kind of had us scratching our head here was that it asked for permission for a microphone, which I get that, um, you know, it's something that you can do with phones and things like that, but does LoomCube come with any kind of built-in uh, microphone feature? Do, is it voice activated? I mean, um, is there any functionality with uh, with microphones or anything like that? No, it, it doesn't have any current microphone technology at, at the moment. It's something we've toyed around with, having some voice control as you're in the studio, being able to uh, to speak to it, kind of like the Alexa mm-hmm. smart home capability, but that is uh, something the design team is, is having fun messing around with, but nothing at the current time. I got you. Okay, so maybe in the future. Got it, got it, got it. So, yep. all right, and uh, yeah, just, you know, again, kind of poking around your website. Um, there you also have a bunch of accessories for uh, professional photographers and things like that. You have a bunch of gel filters and mounting and tri- pods and things like that uh really you know just kind of catering to uh you know i I guess that professional photography area as well 
Yeah, so if you visit the website, limcube.com, you'll see we have it uh, pretty accurately broken down where you can see the variety of lighting options that we, we offer the customers serving both the photo and video community. Uh, drone is a big one. If you keep uh, keep tabs on some of our social and new products, you'll see some cool new products coming out specifically for the drone audience. And so really for us at Limcube, we, we view ourselves as a specialty lighting company trying mm-hmm. to bring specialty lighting solutions to uh, to the marketplace where, of course, we're starting and our core focus right now is really that content creator, somebody who's creating content, um, whether it be on a drone, camera, smartphone, and then now expanding into the uh, more of the everyday user in terms of addressing that video conferencing, Skype, Zoom calls, and the issues where we believe lighting can provide a big impact. And, uh, and so there's some exciting stuff coming out in the future as well. Yeah, definitely looking forward to it. And I know that you mentioned the website, loomcube.com. That's going to be up at computeramerica.com after the interview today. But, um, yeah, I'm going to let you have the last word. If people want to find out more, uh, you mentioned social media on the website. Is that, is that the best place to go? You got it, yeah. L-U-M-E-C-U-B-E is, uh, is our handles on Instagram, which is kind of our, our gallery, if you will, of all the high-end content that our users are creating with LoomCubes, also on our website, and then we've got a number of cool videos on uh, on YouTube and Twitter and stuff. And the LoomCube AirVC, the one that is specific for the video conference, is actually sitting on the shelves of every Apple store around the world cool. and, uh, and available at apple.com as well. So if you are interested in improving your video conferences, uh, you can certainly visit the Apple store near you and don't have to worry about shipping and ordering and all that and can pick one up today. The and and I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, you know, sometimes products just kind of hit us, and we get some ideas for them. And you're free to take this, no charge. But um, a lot of LED lighting solutions out there nowadays come with uh, obviously color changing. You mentioned the different filters and diffusers that you have, which can do that in the gel packs. But uh, any hopes that you know LEDs? They're pretty. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about you know the 1500 lumen area, but color changing or, you know, getting the full 16, 12 million, whatever the heck the color gambit is. Uh, any plans for like a color changing uh, Loom Cube in the future? We've got some exciting things ahead. Yeah, right. we've, uh, where our goal is to stay on the cutting edge of LED technology and really offer a premium, exciting product. So if you, uh, if you keep posted, this is going to be an exciting year for us in terms of bringing new product to market, and we've uh, we've went through some changes in the company last year that have opened up some really exciting R&D opportunities and, uh, and funding in the back end for us to really work on some cool stuff. So I think uh, the past few years of LoomCube have been exciting, but the, the years to come are going to be even more exciting with cr- more creative, newer, more advanced products to come. So, uh, so we'll so, just say you're thinking along the similar lines that we're thinking. Perfect. I, I knew I would not be original, but everyone, uh, this has been Riley Strickland. He is the co-founder and VP of sales and marketing. Riley, thank you so much for the information. And, uh, and yeah, really, you have a, a very great product. I mentioned in, in the uh, in the review up on the website that this is probably going to be my go-to kind of lighting recommendation because, you know, even for a home setting, it's quick, it's easy, it's tiny portable i mean it's really you really have something special here so i want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us thank you so much yeah, it, was a, it was a thrill to be here thanks so much for inviting me and uh, i look forward to it you got a great show there and we we love keeping tabs on everything you guys are doing over there our pleasure our pleasure so hey until next time and uh, and we'll definitely be uh, keeping an eye out but until next time have a great day thank you so much all right you as well bye-bye all right, bye-bye All right, everyone, and there you go. So obviously, you can check that out at ComputerAmerica.com. After the show, we'll have the show notes up and available wherever podcasts are heard. Computer America, search it, should come right up. So that was a lot of fun, obviously, in LoomCube. You can check that out at ComputerAmerica.com. Now, we have about a couple minutes before we hit the uh, you know, before we hit the commercial break so we can introduce our first story and get started with computer and technology news. Here we go. All right, everyone. So why don't we go ahead and get started with, um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started with this one. So this is an article actually involving uh, pop-ups. Here we go. 
pop up in larges at the last second so users can click add uh, so users click on ads instead of the close button and this has been something that's been around for actually quite a while now and I've actually seen ads that will actually uh, shift the entire box over so this is something that's getting more popular and we wanted to bring your attention to this uh, it's un it's underhanded and I hope that the browsing community kind of gets behind it and you know stomps it out before it becomes common practice but here we go just coming out yesterday from ZDNet or ZNet.com and uh, yeah saying that if there's one thing that cyber criminals are good at it's always coming up with new ideas to generate profits in the shadiest and sometimes most original ways and among all criminal groups the most creative bunch are the ones involved with redistribution of traffic from hack sites and because of the quick pace at which browser vendors tend to patch reported problems, these groups need to come up with new tricks more often than their colleagues involved with desktop and mobile malware. Because obviously, you get the malware on there, you're good to go until someone finds it, and hey, it takes a lot longer for it to spread, and yeah, you're good for a while. This though, uh, yeah, they, they tend to be very quick. So, over the past few months, security researchers at Malwarebytes, who studied the evolution of traffic redistribution groups and their respective campaigns, have observed a new method that they're using. And hey, you know what? We're going to get into that idea right after the break. Everyone stay tuned. More Computer America right after this. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. And on the other side of the break, Computer and Technology News brought to you by Computer America. We'll be right back. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airline travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And everyone, welcome back to the Computer America Show. We are doing computer and technology news. We just finished our interview with LoomCube. If you want to check that out, you can check out our website. We have a review of the product or wherever podcasts are heard. Once again, you can check out the full interview. But we continue on and we are just doing the story about, hey, pop-ups and how they may be getting a bit weirder. So obviously everyone... Install a pop-up blocker, install an ad blocker. This is something that is not just about convenience or about shutting people out, but it's about if you visit a lot of different websites, hey, you need to keep yourself safe, and one of the most popular attack vectors is actually injecting malware into ads. Because if you can do that, if you can compromise a, uh, a service's uh, advertisements, then you, in fact, 
tons of websites at a single time. So everyone install an ad blocker and then just whitelist the, the places that you'd like to support. But here we go. Oh, however, here we go. And this is how they're able to do this. Pay attention. When the user moves uh, the person's mouse to close the pop-up, CSS code, uh, so cascading style sheets, code from the page will expand the pop-up and move the ad in the cursor's path. So any click on the button will actually land on the ad instead. In Malwarebytes, uh, they explained that the crooks use CSS code dynamically ex uh, appended to the page that monitors the mouse cursor and reacts when it comes over the X. The timing is important to capture the click a few milliseconds later when the ad banner comes in focus. These client side tricks are, or, yeah, these client side tricks are implemented to maximize ad profits since the revenue generated from ad clicks is much higher. Yes, it's much higher if you actually click on the ad instead of simply uh, viewing the ad. And if you're watching the video portion, you can actually uh, see a nice little GIF of you know this actually happening here, where the uh, where the ad will actually jump in front of the cursor that you're using. Now. Uh, in a report published this week, Seguro said that the trick was being abused by a group who has been recently involved in exploiting a WordPress plugin Zero Day to take over sites. The group planted code on these hack sites to hijack small amounts of traffic so that they'd later be redirect towards various types of sites, such as tech support scams, sites performing ad fraud, or online stores hosting credit card stealing code. So obviously we're going to end this article with uh, with this one, saying that since the latest trick of quickly transposing an ad's position using CSS code, it can't be blocked by a classic ad blocker. However, using an ad blocker would prevent the ad from getting loaded inside the pop-up in the first place and would make the trick useless. So there you go. It's, uh, yeah, not good. There are there are a lot of tricks and ad blockers as much as they are the end of the internet as we know it. At the same time, they're also an important part of keeping your system safe. Very important. So there's that article. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. And uh, let's just do this one really quick. This shouldn't take too long. Okay, everyone. The airport. You've been there, you get there three hours early, the security line takes forever, uh, everyone carries some kind of computer or laptop with them, and it's a whole ordeal to deal with a laptop because you have to unpack it, take out your socks, take out your shoes, take out your laptop, and then put everything back together on the other side. It adds to the whole frustration of the airport. But this coming to us from, from Bloomberg, and actually it's... Uh, this may be over, saying that laptops to stay in bags as TSA brings new technology to airports. That's right. Saying that the agency awards contract for upgrading carry-on screening and that the TSA expects shorter airport wait times with the new technology. One can only hope. Saying that the TSA took a major step in a broader plan to revamp its overall screening process with faster, more advanced technology when it signed a contract Thursday for hundreds of new carry-on baggage screening machines, and this is what they said uh, on Friday. The agency has tested the new technology at more than a dozen airports since 2017, along with relaxed protocols that allow passengers to leave items such as laptops, uh, I'm sorry, laptops inside their luggage. Now, saying that it's not a little bit better, it's a lot better. The technology creates a 3D image of the bag's contents and will eventually be able to detect items automatically that the TSA now asks passengers to remove. In total, they expect to replace more than 2,000 X-ray machines with the CT equipment over the next eight years, and the five-year contract was awarded to Edgewood, and uh, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, yeah, I think that's as far as we're going to take this one, but uh, essentially they're switching from X-ray to CT. Uh, maybe that means that you can get yourself a, T a CT scan if you ask real nicely. You put yourself in a bin and you send yourself through. Uh, you don't have to go to a hospital, but wow, that's a lot of X-ray machines that are going to go out the door and enter CT scanning technology. Pretty cool though. Definitely wanted to, uh, to bring that to everyone's attention that your airport woes might just be getting better now 
here's one that we thought might have been a an April Fool's prank, but luckily it is not. Here we go. Uh, behold, and this is coming to us from the New York Times. Behold, uh, the the beefless impossible Whopper. If you've seen any, any of the advertising for Burger King and their Whopper. Well, you know it's all about the beef. They claim uh, flame broiled uh, beef and two patties or whatever it is. Uh, haven't had a Whopper in a little while, but yeah, well, like two years. But um, here we go. What happens when you replace that with the Impossible Burger? And if you don't know what the Impossible Burger is from Impossible Foods, then you haven't been paying attention to the show because for a while there, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we were super into. Uh, just artificial meats and meat substitutes and, you know, hemoglobin and all this other stuff that made it so that if you bit into one of these burger patties, you would say to yourself, wow, that tastes just like a burger. And that was the goal, was that you create a plant-based burger meat substitute that you could then feed to the masses and they'd be happy with it. Well, here we go. Uh, and you know, I think they made a deal, uh, because it's like impossible foods and they have another company that's actually making really great strides, but they made a deal with white castle. You may, you may remember them, but I think this is going to be the biggest, uh, and, and, and by the way, the article does mention white castle. This is going to be the biggest chain that they have made a deal with so far. And this is exciting because, Hey, you get to try one. Saying that this week, Burger King is introducing a version of its iconic Whopper sandwich filled with a vegetarian patty from the startup Impossible Foods. Saying that the Impossible Whopper, as it will be known, is the biggest validation and expansion opportunity for a young industry that is looking to mimic and replace me with plant-based alternatives. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just about ethics. Even though cows are adorable and we should probably not be eating them, even though they are delicious, but this is also an econ- uh, yeah, in uh, not economic, but yes, it is economic because the the economics of um, feeding the cattle, raising the cattle, the land that goes into the cattle, the uh, the farming land that goes into uh, producing the feed to feed all the cattle. Everything ties into the fact that meat and beef as we know it is just not a sustainable industry, especially as we get more and more people. But on top of that, it's also an environmental impact because, hey, raising all those cattle and, uh, you know, using all that farmland, it's really taxing uh, our nation's, you know, food supply. So that's why it's super important to have a meat substitute. Here's the thing. If it doesn't taste like beef, if it doesn't look like beef, if if it doesn't chew like beef, and if it doesn't bleed like beef, then people probably won't get behind it. They will not drop something because it is worse simply because it is better for everyone. No, it needs to actually be a better product. Because if you can make a product that is better, tastes better, and is affordable, then the only reason that you would stand to eat a cow at that point is because you have some weird hatred for cows. So here we go. The Impossible Whopper, as it will be known, is the biggest valid... uh, Well, actually, we just read that. Impossible Foods and its competitors in Silicon Valley have already had some mainstream successes uh, beyond... Beyond Meat, I was saying Impossible, Beyond is also the other one. Uh, Beyond Meat has been available at over a thousand Carl's Jr. restaurants since January, and the company is now moving toward an initial public offering. Super good. Uh, Yeah, so they also say that White Castle has sold a slider version of the Impossible Burger in its 380 or so stores since late last year. But a national rollout at Burger King's 7,200 locations could dwarf those previous announcements and more than double the total number of locations that Impossible Burgers are available. I will say that personally, living in North Carolina, this is probably going to be the first time I'm going to have the chance to eat something like this. So I'll let you all know, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Burger King's Chief Marketing Officer, Fernan- uh, Fernando Machado. 
said that in the company's testing so far, customers and even employees had not been able to tell the difference between the old meat whopper and the new one. And that is such an important part because if it's if it's indistinguishable, and admittedly, I don't think anyone has ever claimed McDonald's or Burger King had the highest quality meat. Uh, that honor actually goes to Taco Bell. You know, having 40% sawdust will do that. But no, uh, even for something like a Whopper, if the meat is indistinguishable and the price is only either the same price or a dollar or so more, uh, this could be a real big turning point in uh, in the way that we feed the masses. Now, people, and, and of course, a quote from, uh, from Mr. Machado saying that, quote, people on my team who know the Whopper inside and out, they try it and they struggle to differentiate which one is which. Burger King is initially making the Impossible Whopper available at 59 restaurants in the St. Louis area, saying that the company had plans to quickly expand it to every branch in the country if everything in St. Louis goes smoothly. Uh, the Impossible Whopper creates an interesting alliance between a fast food chain that promotes its devotion to beef on every Whopper wrapper, which is, of course, 100% beef with no fillers, and a startup that is committed to getting to people to stop eating beef. I really don't think that they're that incompatible. It's more of the fact that uh, if people have a good option, because up to this point, no offense vegetarians, your options have just not been tasty. Um, I've tried them. They're like, you know, either like these rice patties and things like that. They're just not, they're just not burgers. They're, they're vegetarian burgers. They're okay, but they're not burgers. If you can replace that, if you can actually get burgers that will be burgers, then hey, that's a really good thing. Now, uh, Impossible Foods was, of course, founded in 2011. Mr. Brown, who's the founder, was motivated by his discomfort in the ethical, health, and environmental costs of meat, but he said he came to believe that consumers would change only if they had a product that satisfied their cravings for beef, which is exactly that. Instead of trying to get people to not eat beef, no, you need to give them a viable alternative. Now, several companies are now chasing plant-based foods that imitate meat, and of course, Beyond Burger has based its company on pea protein and beet juice to give its, bur its burgers a bloody look. These, though, rely on hemoglobin. So, hemoglobin, he hemoglobin. Either way, it's super good. So, we are going to skip ahead to the end of the article, saying that the introduction of the Impossible Whopper does not mean that Burger King is relaxing its commitment to producing meat, saying that it's, uh, it's, uh, as its recent marketing for chicken fries and baking king sandwich make it clear, but the company said that it's raising numbers of consumers looking to cut back on meat, uh, especially beef. And he said that Burger King found a way to satisfy the demand without the trade-offs that traditionally come with vegetarian alternatives. So there you go. I'm looking forward to this. I'm hoping that uh, it comes to all areas this week. But um, yeah, very, very cool. Looking forward to this. Okay, everyone, there's that article. Let's go ahead and swap over to story number four. How about this one? I think everyone knows what an IMAX is. If you've seen a theater recently, IMAX theaters are all the rage. They, you know, they're much larger, they're much nicer, they uh, they cost a lot more than a traditional movie ticket, uh, a lot better sound, sometimes 3D, IMAX 3D, it's a thing. Uh, IMAX theaters were a s head and shoulders above a regular movie experience, but they were solitary. It was just an IMAX or a regular theater. Well, now, hey, we could have a competitor. And competition is good. It means that people have to innovate to stay ahead. But here we go. THX, uh, you may know them for their, uh, you know, for their logo with the big booming sound. THX large format cinema will take on IMAX later this year. Article from Gadget by Steve Dent saying that it will debut at the Regency Westwood Village Theater in Los Angeles. THX will debut its premium large format brand called THX Ultimate Cinema this spring or summer, it announced, saying that it will feature a dual laser 4K Barco projectors and a THX certified 7.1 uh, immersive sound system 
and it will take on the likes of IMAX and Dolby in the premium large format category. So IMAX theaters, Dolby theaters, uh, welcome THX. It will debut at uh, at the 1,400-seat Regency Westwood Village Theater in L.A., which has hosted numerous red carpet premieres. So it's uh, you know kind of the introduction, uh, you know, meet the technology kind of press review kind of thing, and then it will come to others uh, later. THX will specifically ma- master up to 30 films per year for its system which also support regular movies via digital cinema package projection. uh, THX is no doubt hoping to use the first installation as advertising. It didn't mention the price to equip a theater, but the projector alone, the projector alone, so that dual 4K digital uh, laser, dual laser 4K barco, cost, get this, $1 million dollars. Just for the projector. Insane. Theaters with IMAX and other large format screens can generally sell tickets at a premium and draw in moviegoers who might otherwise stay home. Because obviously, um, you know, maybe a traditional format or a large screen, you know, just a large screen because you can be at home and you could watch on, let's say if someone has a 60 or 65 or 70 inch television, a large screen alone won't do it for you. But, uh, a huge, huge, massive screen, great sound in a movie theater that you can't get anywhere else. That is the appeal they're hoping that will get you out of your sofa and into a movie theater. Now, uh, there are something like 18 different large format brands, but THX does have great advantage of, of course, brand brand recognition. Um, yeah, so there you go. Let's go ahead and uh, and kind of stop that one there. But THX looking to get into the large theater, uh, the large format theater arena, which again a good thing if you enjoyed that kind of thing. Now, uh, looking through some of our other stories, why don't we go ahead and talk about? Uh, yeah, let's talk about Facebook. So two different Facebook ones. We'll cover each one pretty quickly and then move on because it's uh, you know pretty pretty easy. The first one, Facebook removes over a thousand pages ahead of India's election. This is something that I'm just, same concern I had previously with Facebook and when they said that they came out and, and erased uh, 2,600 profiles and pages and things like that. Uh, Well, they've erased about 1,100 pages, groups, and accounts ahead of India's general election, saying that most of the accounts, which were based in India and Pakistan, were flagged for coordinated, inauthentic behavior, and in total, Facebook removed 700 pages, groups, and accounts linked to two networks in India, with another 100 pages, groups, and accounts were deleted in connection with uh, with a network in Pakistan, and 300 Facebook pages and accounts in India were removed, violating the company's rules against spam. Uh, the, this is the latest in Facebook's ongoing attempt to keep the platform from being manipulated around elections, uh, saying that earlier this month in the UK, they removed about 137 accounts and more than 900 pages in Iran and Indonesia for coordinating inauthentic behavior. The point of this, The point of all this, with all these numbers and all these facts, is simply the fact that people are using Facebook to manipulate others. It's a great platform for that, especially for new and emerging markets or upcoming countries and places that just don't have, I guess, even in the United States, digital literacy is really pathetic. Uh, the ability for people to identify sources, to validate sources, to see information, and to say that this information comes from a reputable place is really bad in America. And we've had the internet readily available in most people's homes for about 20 years, you know, 20, 25 years. For other places that simply have a smartphone and are using social media for the first time in, you know, only a couple of years. And the idea that, uh, you know, Fake, fake stories and fake sources and fake information can disseminate out there so fast, uh, just like a rumor mill. That's something that these places with a 
billion people or 900 million people in India alone are going to have to put up with and you know identify because 900 million people will be eligible to vote in India's upcoming election. It's um yeah, it's going to be something else and Facebook again, I don't know. When when you have 900 million people and you say that uh you know you deleted 1100 pages and accounts which like they said they only deleted about uh 800 or well it, it, the article doesn't say exactly because they mix pages and accounts together but let's say 50 50 600 people versus 900 million and that's only coming from the you know and that's only the people in india let alone people who would like to uh influence the people voting in india i feel like there's going there's going to be a lot more and Facebook's algorithm to check up on this needs to be improved greatly. But I digress. There you go. So there's the first one. Second one, Facebook, just real quick. Um, and then we'll move on to shape-shifting planes. But Facebook wants your input on a content oversight board. Very important. Saying that the uh, all the data is anonymous by default, although you can volunteer to share excerpts and receive inquiries from Facebook if it has questions. The consultation phase only lasts six weeks as of April 1st, so you'll want to act quickly if you want to offer feedback. And again, the feedback is uh, towards a content oversight board and is asking for everyone's input. It's launching today. And it uses a survey to ask how everyone would like to run the oversight body. It's a multiple choice questionnaire, but there's also an option in the essay section that you can uh, share your specific ideas. It wants to know that its existing content moderation leaves something to be desired. It doesn't want an overseer that repeats the same mistakes. So if you want to tell Facebook that, hey, you're being too draconian on this or you're being too lax on that, then this is where you would want to go. Check that out. That's available at Facebook. All right, last article. Last one we have time for, probably. This is from Christine Fisher in Gadget, and their new meta material could make air travel more efficient, more energy efficient, where researchers have designed a shape shifting airplane wing. That's right. You read that right. This is awesome. If you've ever had a window seat next to the wing of a plane, you've probably watched as the flaps on the wing engage and disengage as a plane takes off and lands. This is because in each phase of flight, takeoff, landing, cruising, maneuvering, the ideal wing parameters vary. Saying that until now, we've had to uh, we we've made do by modifying rigid wings with hinged surfaces, but imagine if the entire wing could change shape. And that's what researchers led by NASA and MIT are working towards. You know, so if you've ever seen a plane and they have those little flaps on the on the back portion of the uh, airplane wing, and they go up when they're landing or they stay down when they're cruising, uh, yeah, that's what they're hoping to improve upon. In a paper in the journal Smart Materials and Structures, the research team explains how it has radically redesigned the airplane wing. And if you're watching the video portion, you can see uh, a CGI there or an example right there. Uh, their new structure is a lightweight lattice framework. Uh, for anyone out there who's simply listening to the radio show, it looks kind of like wicker. Imagine a very tightly woven material, but it's a bunch of tiny triangles of matchstick-like struts covered in a thin polymer layer. So it's very, uh, you know, very closely engineered. But they're saying that uh, it's less than one thousandth the density of rubber, and the carefully positioned struts allow the wing to change shape automatically in response to changes in aerodynamic loading conditions. Both factors could make aircraft more energy efficient. Saying that this isn't an entirely new concept, it was uh, presented a few years ago, but now the researchers had developed a way to manufacture the individual parts for the wing using injection molding, which is important because just like, uh, oh, what's that technology called? Uh, carbon nanotubes or, uh, oh my God, uh, 
that miracle material that will never make it out of the lab, just because you can make something and say this could be one of the greatest improvements we've ever made, if you can't make it, if you can't design for it and make it really, really, really efficiently, then it's of no use because you, you know, whatever trade-offs in energy efficiency you have, you can't put that all in the front end and say, well, it's going to take a lot more money to produce. Saying that the potential for, and to finish up the article, the potential for a lightweight shape-shifting wing raises questions about the ideal aircraft shape. With this technology, we might be able to break away from the tube with wings design and utilize a more efficient configuration, possibly an integrated body and wing structure. If the idea of watching the airplane wing change shape is through 30,000 feet of arms here, don't worry yet, this is a long way from commercial airlines. But essentially every design that we've seen so far, imagine something like a B-52 self bomber. Yeah, that's about what we're looking at in the examples. So everyone, the music means that we're done here. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us here on Computer America. It's been a lot of fun, and we want to, uh, of course, redirect you to ComputerAmerica.com. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to email us at live at ComputerAmerica.com. And be sure to check out uh, everything that we do, either articles, videos, uh, podcasts, and, of course, the radio show. In the meantime, everyone, thank you so much. We'll catch you next time. Have a great day, and uh, hey, happy April Fools. We didn't pull anything on you. Everything, you can believe us in everything, but hopefully, uh, you know, today hasn't been too hard on you. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll catch you here next time. Bye-bye, everyone.